Thank you very much. My, my job here today, after a kind invitation to come and spend a little bit of time with you uh, and act a little bit of a bri as a bridge, really, between the fantastic local success story that you've been hearing about from Duncan this morning to, I suspect, what might happen after your coffee break, trains willing. Uh, you're going to hear a little bit more about the international context and, and, and opportunities from, from Nick uh, when he arrives with you today. So my job is to step back a little bit and give a little bit of an, a broader overview and try and connect the local with the global a little bit and also to connect with some of the conversations that I know you've got coming up during the course of today later on uh, when I think about international trade, about climate change, uh, about skills and the development of skills uh, and requirements that we have uh, and so on. So I'm, I'm hoping that some of the things that I might say to you in the next 15 minutes or so uh, in the run-up to your coffee break might trigger some thoughts for some of the conversations that will happen later today. So we've already heard this morning that the, uh, the, the energy estuary here in Humberside is far from a PR headline uh, or a news story. It's a real world jewel in the northern powerhouse and the UK energy system. The Humber has been so crucial to the British economy, as Chris has already mentioned, through the centuries with its access to the North Sea in particular. And its role in the UK energy system actually really does take some beating. A third of the UK's coal was imported here. A sixth of the UK's electricity generated here. A fifth of the UK's natural gas lands here. And a third of the UK's fuel refined here. And it's this heritage, this accomplishment and ingenuity that will undoubtedly serve the Humber and the wider Northern Powerhouse, actually, as we build and response to the greatest challenge that this sector faces, and indeed society does, and that's the climate challenge. So as I said, I'm not 106. I've been involved in this for about 25 years now, so don't try and do any more maths. But there's, there's always been change underway when I've been in, in, in the privileged position of being able to have conversations like these and, and talk to people in the sector. But I do think, ladies and gentlemen, actually, this is the, the case now that everything is changing, and fundamentally, and I also think irreversibly. So let me zoom out a little bit and examine what I mean from a global point of view for a few moments. There are a handful of factors, I believe, actually, that are stacking up to make this change irreversible. In fact, there's five of them that are mutually reinforcing factors. The first of those is that the climate science has never been clearer. We must remove harmful greenhouse gases from the atmosphere to levels that limit the damage that global temperature rises can cause. And thank goodness we have people like the Energy Institute's past president, Professor Jim Ski, and other colleagues on the IPCC for the clarity of the science base. It's their synthesis of this global climate science that underpins the Paris Agreement, of course, and the actions required to achieve it and go beyond it. And its driven science-based mitigation strategies are starting to translate now into the language of business. Last year's special report on 1.5 degrees further altered the understanding of the relative benefits of striving for more than going below two. It was the starkest picture yet, actually, of the likely impacts on ecosystems, human life and economies around the world. 1.5 degrees will require, to quote the IPCC, rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. The second factor, the real world impacts are increasingly obvious and sadly beyond dispute. It's no longer hypothetical. Greenland's ice, melting ice sheet, Hurricane Dorian's destructive force in the Bahamas, and closer to home, of course, flash flooding causing the dam collapse near Whaley Bridge. Just some of the stark examples and reminders of the impacts our, claim, our cli changing climate is having. And indeed, the IPCC earlier this year increased the upper limit of predicted sea level rises by 10 centimetres. Doesn't sound a lot, but that's up to 1.1 metres, which may leave large swathes of hull and the surrounding area underwater by 2100 if there is a modest increase of two degrees in global temperatures. And at the moment, we're on a trajectory to go way past that. The third factor, the targets are being recalibrated to net zero. I am really heartened by the UK's decision to do this on the advice of the Committee on Climate Change to move the Climate Change Act's goal to net zero. It's a powerful signal to markets of the direction of travel. Slowly, other countries are doing the same. In fact, I think there are almost 60 uh, countries who are either talking about it or who are already committed to go in the same direction on some slightly different timelines, but, but, but broadly there. 
but it's not just countries, it's states, it's cities, it's companies and it's industrial sectors who are getting in on the act, which is really important. We can expect the pressure to build as we approach the introduction of the Paris Accord next year and of course the hosting of the COP26 here in the UK in Glasgow. Fourth aspect, public pressure is here to stay in my view. Huge public pressure is building behind ambitious action on climate change and that means pressure on governments as well as on our sector. Pressure inspired by the likes of Greta and David uh, and also by movements like school strikes and Extinction Rebellion. In fact, we were on the platform yesterday with Extinction Rebellion having a very sensible conversation, uh, which was nice to have them inside the room as opposed to listening to the shouting from outside the room. Uh, I can tell you, actually, it made an important difference. Having a profound, this is having a profound impact, of course, on how governments view their electability, how companies see their reputations, and the combined effect of the science, the impacts, the targets, the public pressure are also bringing a noticeable shift, of course, in investor relations, behaviours and challenge. And the fifth and perhaps most exciting factor of all for me is just the sheer possibility, and I think Duncan's just given a flavour of how quickly and, and how uh, dynamically with, with innovation we can really drive change. Falling costs of solar, of wind, of storage, opening up opportunities for deployment that we could have just not imagined only a few years ago. And we'd be crazy not to pursue this just as Duncan has helpfully described. The cost reductions we're seeing in some technologies not only put them on a par with conventional fuels, they also like the way for the next generation of technologies to follow them on the downward cost curve, which is really important. That shift to low carbon, I would argue, because of all of these converging factors, means that it's gathering its own economic momentum. Doesn't mean it doesn't need some support still, but it is gathering some momentum. Whether it's fast enough, I would argue is probably the most important question now. For us in this sector, we need to bring about transformational change in order to approach the developing, supplying and use of energy at a vastly, vastly accelerated pace to today. In the UK, change in our energy system is happening, as you've already heard. Half of the electricity used in our homes and businesses is now low carbon when you combine renewable technologies alongside nuclear. And in, a th in the third quarter of this year, for the first time, renewable energy sources provided more electricity than fossil fuels. This is a great headline, but so much more is needed. In heat, in transport, and everything in between, all sectors need to take their part, and energy, the energy sector needs to be the enabler in the system. And that brings me to energy demand. The climate challenge is essentially an energy challenge. But there's another monumental global energy challenge that sometimes gets a little bit lost and eclipsed in the public debate, particularly when you're here, and that's the global challenge for access to energy. Growing demand. When we talk about decarbonisation of our energy system, we're not only talking about the energy we use today, but we need to think about the energy that we will all need in the future. Even with improving efficiency in certain sectors and parts of the world, the IEA foresees overall energy demand continuing to grow by a quarter by 2040. That's fast. At the most elemental level, we simply cannot ignore the fact that nearly a billion people still do not have access to electricity today. We don't feel it here, but an awful lot of people do. And three billion still cook on open fires in their homes, leading to more than four million premature deaths every single year, and most of those deaths are women and children. Universal access to affordable energy is crucial to prosperity and also to human well-being and development, and it's, and, and it's deserved. Alongside that comes rapid growth, of course, as people lift themselves out of poverty from low- and middle-income countries in Asia, South America, and of course, sub-Saharan Africa, and they climb that development ladder, which is absolutely their right to do. I was at a conference two weeks ago with my team in Nigeria. I go to Lagos every year. Uh, and you cannot fail to be struck by the energy. Not the, time we're, not the sort we're talking about here now, but the vibrancy uh, and the enthusiasm for opportunity and for development in the country. Lagos will become the world's largest metropolis if it continues to grow at the rate it is, and a home to a staggering 85 million plus people. Just enormous. And most of those people do not have access to secure, affordable, clean electricity. 
That brings huge challenges, obviously, in terms of development uh, and urbanisation, all of which energy has to enable, providing water, sanitation, homes, hospitals, transportation systems and the like. The world needs to address both of these challenges, climate change and the access to energy, in parallel so that we can provide uh, affordable energy to the billions that don't have it in a low carbon way that meets our climate goals. So let me come back to the northern solutions. I'm a great believer in technological advancement and the power of the, the role of technology and the human ingenuity, of course, that lies behind those technological developments. Despite the scale of the twin challenge that I've outlined uh, and that others have provided the science for, I think we have some real opportunities. When I look at what's going on in our field here in the, in the north of England, I don't just see a powerhouse for the UK, but potentially one for the world. Because some of the most vital technologies have huge global potential, and Duncan made flavour of that and, and made reference to that just towards the end of his presentation too. I'll give you three examples, and I'll go quickly through the offshore wind one, because Duncan's already alluded to. But we, we heard from him about the incredible story uh, that Orsted's journey has, has now provided and, and will continue to do so, providing electricity through Hornsey One uh, to the equivalent of what, more than a million UK homes. It will join others, of course, already operational, as you've heard, and Hornsey Two, Hornsey Three, vast potential of Dogger Bank, and so on. The sector deal envisages a third of electricity coming from offshore wind by 2030, and there's potential to do more. This region's role in offshore wind is also about its manufacturing base, as you heard, and the supply chain development. In Hull, Siemens Gamesa and Associated British Ports have invested, as you probably are aware, 310 million jointly to make turbine blades for offshore wind as the centrepiece of the Greenport Hull project in the city's Alexander Dock. All of these North of England projects are at the heart of a vast UK success story, and it's one we just don't sell hard enough. We're really not very good at telling fantastic stories, and this one absolutely is. The UK is the biggest offshore wind market in the world, with more than a third of installed capacity, and one which is driving down costs, as we've already seen this morning. The global market for this technology and this capability is massive. The IEA just two weeks ago published its offshore wind outlook, a pretty rigorous study forecasting this, this turning into a trillion dollar global market by 2040 with a 15-fold increase in capacity. And if you look even further out, it sees scope for offshore wind to generate more than 18 times global electricity demand today, which, as I've just described, is going to be pretty necessary based on current predictions for population growth and others. Second technology I'd like to touch on is uh, carbon capture and utilisation storage. Not least given yesterday's announcement during, I think, the course of the conference uh, from the um, Zero Carbon Humber campaign, uh, I'm really excited about the opportunities that there are here and, and in other parts of the country to really see this technology playing a leading role in cleaning up our conventional power and industrial clusters, energy supply and use. Look at what Drax has planned after decades of coal dependency. They then moved to biomass and now, of course, the groundbreaking trial to become Europe's first bioenergy carbon capture and storage project. On taking the collaboration fronted by OGCI, CCUS project in Teesside aiming to decarbonise a cluster of carbon intensive businesses could be as early as 2030. These technologies, too, are set to be at the forefront of meeting the global energy needs in a cleaner way. The IEA sustainable development scenario has CCUS delivering 7% of the cumulative emissions reductions needed globally by 2040. This implies, of course, a really rapid scale-up of CCUS deployment from around 30 million tonnes of CO2 currently captured each year to more like 2,300 million tonnes to 2040. That's a 76-fold increase. Again, the scale is huge. And in three of the IPC's four illustrative pathways to limiting global average temperatures to 1.5 degrees or below, BECCS needs to play a role, depending obviously, of course, on the downward trajectory for fossil fuel uh, emissions. Although there are concerns about the pressures BECCS plays on supply chains and other systems, it's nevertheless a set of technologies that we need to understand more fully by doing. Drax can do this and pave the way, as can some other projects for removing emissions from the atmosphere, potentially on a global scale. And the third technology I'd like to mention is hydrogen, being pioneered again here in the north of England. 
Northern Gas Networks, Cadent and Equinor are trailblazing with their visionary H21 North of England pilot, which aims to deploy hydrogen using some existing gas networks across the northwest of England and to Yorkshire. If adopted more widely across the UK, using hydrogen like this for the heat network could save the amount of carbon equivalent to taking two and a half million cars off the road. And the behaviour change required to go with that, which I'd argue is probably more difficult. Looking at this globally, the scope of technologies, the companies and the professionals that, who develop them is enormous. The Hydrogen Council foresees a market for hydrogen and hydrogen technologies with revenues of more than 2.5 trillion per year and jobs for more than 30 million people globally. This is not small beer. These three technologies are fantastic beacons of northern innovation and success in the field of energy right here with global relevance, I think, to the twin challenges of cutting harmful greenhouse gas emissions and meeting the growing needs of populations around the world. And that leads me to my last point, people. Technologies are on their way, ladies and gentlemen. The cost reductions are coming through, uh, the political will is getting ever stronger as the science and the real world realities of our situation bite. So I'd like to finish on something that doesn't get the same amount of airtime probably as, uh, as others, and it should, because it's critical. We need to be sure we have the human capital to get this job done, that the people and the skills are where they need to be and to the standard that they need to be. We should be confident in the advances being made here and in other places, of course, but we mustn't be complacent about our access to talent. The Energy Institute is all about supporting the development of the energy workforce as it navigates some of these really big challenges. Through our work at both national level and through active branches such as here in the Humber, we bring the energy community together. That's part of our responsibility. <coughs> Providing professional qualifications, training and recognition. Curating knowledge and trying to share that amongst professionals to give a widescreen view of this tremendous energy system. We're focused on a pipeline of new talent, on those that are embarking on their careers, as much as we are on supporting experienced leaders dealing with uh, this ever-changing environment and upping, helping them to up their professional game to lead through it. We're as much for those working in conventional oil and gas, on which we rely for 60% of our energy still, as we are for the innovation on new and low-carbon technologies. We want to ensure today's and tomorrow's energy professionals are equipped as they develop and deploy the existing low carbon technologies needed to avert the worst impacts of the climate threat we face and deliver for those who yet have access to affordable energy. Part of our work, for example, is in health and safety. We do a lot of work in health and safety in the energy sector. We're fast extending the work we've done for 90 odd years plus in uh, health and safety uh, industry good practice in the oil and gas sector and looking at how that can be helpful and useful to other parts of the energy system that are uh, developing and maturing. So for example, now we are, have been for some time actually the home of the G plus offshore wind health and safety group. So we, we are the custodian and producer for all of the offshore uh, wind HSE work that gets done in terms of uh, Orsted and other companies uh, leading on that. And we bring people together in a collaborative way to make that happen. Last year, we started up the same programme for uh, called Safety On for the onshore wind industry to show similar leadership on some of these big issues around looking after people. And in storage too, which you've heard will play a crucial role uh, in going forward. We've also started to publish guidance around the assessment of risk for those who are making planning decisions and others about where storage facilities can be. And in collaboration with partners and stakeholders, we're scoping out new projects now in CCUS guidance, hydrogen and integrated networks guidance. So as the world evolves, so must we. Partly the reason why we're 106, I think. So in conclusion, uh, I believe it's within our grasp to tackle these dual challenges. I think it's tough, uh, and I think we need to deploy all the manpower, girl power, and everything else that we have at our disposal to make this possible, which means the workforce that we will have to deliver this will not look like the workforce that it does today. And I mean our industry needs to look more like and reflect the society that we serve. Progress in opening up our sector to new talent from all parts of society sadly has been glacial. There are pockets of success, but broadly as a sector, we've not done great. Survey after survey, report after report. And I'm only going to give you one example which relates to, to, to gender balance. 
The pipeline for feeding the entry level is challenging, with inadequate numbers of young girls being interested uh, and enthused by STEM subjects at schools and then through colleges and into universities and, and so on. But actually, I'm partly I'm not surprised, because when they look up and out and they're looking for role models in our field, there's not enough. They're few and far between. We each have to take some responsibility for that and make more effort to be more visible. But actually, we all, it's a numbers game too. We need to rebalance our workforce far more effectively than we do at the moment. I'm a board member of something called Powerful Women, and the latest statistic in that initiative is really quite shocking. Only 16% of board seats in the UK energy companies are occupied by women. 40% of energy companies listed or registered and headquartered in the UK do not have any women on their board at all. Now, you know, that's morally wrong in the society we live in today, uh, but actually it's just not smart for good business. Rebalancing the talents that we have around our table, bringing in new perspectives, mixing up and disrupting the thought and the conversation that happens in the top tables of our top organisations will bring better business outcomes Study after study tells you that that's what happens. So we need to work harder. We need to change it. And the ask of our profession in meeting the challenges we've talked about requires all of the brains in the room. So we really need to work harder to reach out to parts of society who are underrepresented in our sector today. And as I stand here now, there'll be people having a far more interesting morning because there will be thousands of kids across the UK who've logged on to a live assembly called the Big Assembly, tens of thousands of kids around the UK, logging on online to be impassioned and enthused by engineers who are excited about the opportunities to do transformational things in this country and, and many others around the world through having a STEM career, and not least of which, bringing them into the energy sector being important. So if you want to watch that on playback, bigassembly.org, uh, and also show your kids, please. If we can get this right, there is a real opportunity for business and individuals operating not just here in the Northern Powerhouse, of course, but all, all around the world to provide the solutions that we need. The world of energy, the technologies, the investments involved are obviously complex. We know they're long term and we know that the public debate can sometimes be polarised. But it's through important events like this one today that we can generate the discussions needed amongst the expert community to support the role that sound science and evidence base must place in, in our decision making going forward to create our energy future. So thank you for listening to me this morning, and I hope that you will have a really enjoyable and stimulating day in some of those workshop sessions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. I've got three questions, so <laughs> microphone chasers, shout when, you, when you've got one. Hi, I'm Brian Sellers. Uh, I'm from a company called Commonplace, who do digital community engagement. Um, I have a question um, related to the last comments about people. Uh -huh. um, it was great to hear you talk about individuals um, of both sexes um, making a contribution to this fantastic journey uh, in the energy markets. Um, carbon capture is uh, a very interesting um, technological discussion, but the most efficient individual um, carbon capture device is called a tree um, and we've not mentioned in the one and a quarter days that we've been here the role of trees and planting trees and bushes in our society as individuals as well as big businesses uh, to solve this problem of climate change so what I'd ask is your support to encourage every individual here and their families to get behind a tree planting program and a bush planting program that balances, um, let's call it, the local um, population needs of a healthier environment as well as a vibrant business in the energy field. Thank you. There well you go. Said. It's a fair, fair, fair challenge and I, and I think a sensible pledge. I think I, I probably don't need to reiterate for you. I think you've done, it, you've, you've done that very well. And I think if you start to look at what some of the, um, certainly some of those companies who are diversing the, diversifying their energy portfolios, so you think about some of the big oil and gas companies, for example, who are transitioning their own businesses, actually the role that nature plays and maximising what nature can do 
uh, it's carbon sinks, tree planting, whatever it might be, is starting to come to the fore. So it's not just the charitable and the voluntary schemes that we see at a local level, which I absolutely do, do endorse. And in fact, the Energy Institute's done that in Westminster, because where I'm headquartered, you can actually buy a tree. You don't own the tree, but you can buy the tree and, and have it planted. So, so there, I know there are lots of those sorts of things all over the country. So I completely agree with you, but it's, it's good to see some of these bigger organisations working with nature at scale because it, it's a bit like energy efficiency. You know, you should be doing the simple stuff first. Absolutely right. Right, thank you. Question up there somewhere. Hi, um, my name's Robin Pegg, and I've been involved with innovation over the last 20 years in developing some sustainable technologies. One of the challenges that I think needs to be changed in this, get into this zero carbon economy, is to change the way innovation is handled in this country, particularly yeah legislation, the state aid EU legislation binds innovation in some respects where you've got people who've got no money to develop some of these ideas or proof of concepts and to go through the re legislation and the rigmarole is just tired and demanding. So what's really needed is you take the, the climate change taxes that the taxes <coughs> and those people are paying and you take that into a disruption fund that will back proof of concept or concepts that are just theory to turn them into proof of concept and into commercial solutions. And you use that fund to match with the European or the EU money to actually help these people get started and change this environment. I, I, I think you're absolutely right on the point about innovation and turning that into something. I think, I think in, we've had pockets of success, and I, I can't speak for government and, and, and the way that they organise funding, uh, but I'm, I'm very conscious that in, in our communications with Bayes and some other departments, we have made this point repeatedly that actually we do some quite interesting and disruptive things at the beginning of the innovation process, but we're not very co good completer finishers, and then we lose the competitive advantage, and that goes somewhere else in the world. And so that's where, you know, for me, that's why I think that sort of second half of the chain almost is, is where we need to put some, some emphasis on doing things differently. So I, I completely agree with you. And we have made that, we have and continue to make that messaging, not least in the context of the industrial strategy and then connecting that to international export opportunity and trade, uh, to try and get them to be more agile and more flexible about their approach and, and the, the way in which they model support for innovation. But basically what you need to do is you need to back the entrepreneurs because it's yeah. entrepreneurs that cause disruption. Yeah. Just look at the Silicon Valley changes, what that brought about to the computer industry, the, the world we live in today. And you now got to do that with the carbon thing because the energy companies have all admitted there isn't enough juice to power the electric car. So you either have the lights on or you power your car. So we've got to, in that 2050 situation, you've got to be disruptive now. Uh, we've spent 20 years developing a sustainable tyre for the tyre industry, but they're only coming around to accepting what we created 20 years ago now because of the slow Too inability slow. to accept okay. change, and that has to be put more forward. Thank you very much. Another question, I think, somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've got one here. 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 <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Gil Bondeslaus. Uh, I represent FM Plus based in Hessel. Um, I have a question more from the consumer point of view. Uh, I appreciate that this is a business forum and obviously the Energy Institute no doubt puts forward the viewpoint and obviously the interests of business to tackle the carbon problem. Um, the one thing that I've missed over the last two days is that we can partly solve the problem by eradicating waste and I'm, particularly I'm talking about energy waste. Um, I think that obviously um, it's not profitable to reduce the demand in the market. So, for instance, if we um, got some government policy that said, well, we need to, um, to tackle fuel poverty, and we'll do that through making as many buildings as possible energy neutral. Um, obviously, decentralization of energy gen generation behind the meter I'm talking about. Um, for instance, I'm installing my own solar panels, heat pump, uh, I've got an EV, all those things that I can do because obviously I'm in a, a fortunate position. But I think social housing and all the other um, 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 association housing, etc., that that probably have to work in tandem with government policy and government funding, um, isn't it not better to try and give those people a bit of a, a platform as well? Because obviously business 
on its own is not going to solve the energy crisis or the, the, the climate crisis. So obviously, I think if we get more involvement from a consumer point of view, if we work together on this, there would be plenty of profit for business as well. But at the same time, we can eradicate fuel poverty. And I think that is something that is not being addressed at the moment. Because we heard this 40 years ago with the nuclear industry, that energy or electricity was going to be virtually free. And it didn't happen. And I'm scared that once the offshore industry has monopolized uh, electricity production, because off onshore has been more or less blocked through policy, that again, the energy prices will keep rising and rising and consumers are not going to benefit. How do okay. you feel about that? Um, thank you for those, those, those points. Uh, for it, to begin with, the Energy Institute is a charitable organisation, so we exist for public good. So I'm not here to represent the industry, I'm here to kick the industry's backside. That's in terms of my raison d'etre, that, that's what we do. I do it politely, <laughs> but it is about nudging and pushing and encouraging and supporting in order for the industry to keep raising the bar, whether that's on moving to low carbon, health and safety practice, or whatever else it might be, in terms of what good looks like. So, so my, I, I, I'm very aligned with some of the things that you've, you've just said, and, and, but I do disagree with one of the points, which is that um, there isn't a business model that you can deploy to encourage energy companies to encourage people to use less energy. I absolutely think that is a huge part of the solution. And whilst we've tried it and tripped over ourselves with energy service companies and, and some models in the recent past, there are some interesting disruptive entrepreneurial models that are starting to come through, which are looking at how people can actually have profitable business with purpose and drive energy efficiency demand down. I, I don't think that it is the whole answer, but it's an important part of the answer. Um, and if you saw the, the REBA award for this year was actually to a social housing development, which is a low carbon development. It's a fantastic piece of uh, design and innovation and, and, and development in the, in the built environment. But it needs um, to become government policy. That's the problem, you yeah, see. No, no. I mean, the government it's not done on a large enough scale. Absolutely. And of course, the, the, the government made some daft decisions in, rela in relation to zero carbon housing and unravelling that, for example. So. There is a disconnect across the, 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 the government in terms of these policies needing to be connected right across the piece. Uh, and just redesigning the stationery for the government department or changing its name is not going to do it. Uh, and if you look at what the Committee on Clim uh, Climate Change have said in their, their latest report, in the starkest assessment to get to the numbers we need to, 60% of that is about behaviour change. It's about what you and I do differently. Absolutely. You sound like you're doing a fantastic job already. Uh, and the rest, putting the rest of us to shame, but actually it, it, it's a huge, huge movement. And it's quite a risky strategy, as opposed to doing things at scale in, in, a, you know, in a big corporate sense, to rely on each of us as citizens to, to make a difference is quite a big ask. And behavioural scientists will tell you that it is really difficult to do, but it doesn't mean we don't try, because I think we have to try all of these things and try and marshal everybody in the right direction to do what they can. Last question, I think. Uh, Ian Madley from Manchester Metropolitan University. I'd just like to explore, all of us sat here are, are energy people effectively, and we understand the scale and the challenges. Yeah. But how do we bring other sectors along? I'd just like to give you two examples. So last year, 20% of the new houses built in this country were below EPCC. Yeah. That is criminal to say the least. Yeah. Uh, and, and you look at what was announced yesterday by the Green Party, they were going to put £100 million into retrofit. That's about 5% of how much we need to spend on current prices. So how do we, how do we help other sectors understand the scale of the challenges they need to make to help us deliver these zero carbon I think for us as a sector, obviously, the, the natural route for that is partnership and collaboration. But I think the, above that, there needs to be a framework which is state-led and regulated, which drives transformation and change. And so that's where we need some bravery and some ambition uh, and, and some guidance, actually. So, so whilst we talk about uh, the energy policy guidance that we might be interested in, and I don't believe we want a detailed plan... I think we want some clear, sort of high-level signals to tell us the direction of travel and then let business get on with it. 
uh, in, in the hope that money and everything else is in, in, in place to be able to do these things. I think for other sectors where we've got to take our intellectual clout and capability to show them how energy is an enabler to get to, to low carbon agriculture, low, low, whatever it might be, automotive and so on, then um, we can take our expertise and we can partner and we can join venture. We're actually very good at that as a sector. We know how to do that quite well. We've got lots of models for that. But it's this regulatory framework and then it's things about putting a value on the price of carbon and, and how those, those sorts of instruments at a state level are introduced to drive sectors in the right direction. Again, it's high level signals, not detailed plans, not overly prescriptive, but they all need to, to line up so that you can work sector by sector to start to make these transformations. Because if we just do it in energy, that's not going to cut it. Yeah, I'm just not going to cut it. Just one last very quick question. Uh, well, just a very quick comment. If you want to plant trees and bushes, don't use Google. Use Ecosia, which is a website that every time you search, you will be planting trees. That's not the real, real question. It, it, on the uh, homes thing, the future homes standard is currently out of consultation, so hopefully that's going to improve the situation a lot soon. Um, but my last question, the actual question, uh, and it kind of goes to Duncan and Louise, Lots of stuff going on on offshore. You've touched on onshore, Louise. Um, government policy hasn't really been behind onshore for a while now. Do we have a feel for where that's going? Um, I, I can't answer for, for, for the government, sadly. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know, Duncan, if, if you've got any in, in intelligence on that. Um, certainly, our work with the onshore industry is around sort of the impro improving and upping the game on the health and safety performance of the industry. And in, in those conversations, which has only really taken off in the last nine months or so, there is a definite positive move about the industry getting back off the blocks again and, and picking up momentum. Uh, in spite of, potentially, I suspect, prob probably the policy environment. Yeah. Um, so, but I don't know, Duncan, do you have anything to add? Nothing, nothing unique, but I think warming to it is the uh, I think there's evidence that Scotland is moving. Scotland and the, the Highlands, where there's nobody there, they are changing <laughs> the, the rules there. Yeah. Uh, this is NIMBYism class one. Uh, my impression is that the NIMBY lobby is weakening and that we will get more onshore in the future than we had. Uh, the interesting point was somebody said yesterday that offshore wind is now probably competing with onshore wind in terms of cost, which is amazing when you think about it, uh, because of the scale, I suppose. You can't put these huge apparatuses on, on, onshore that we're able to put offshore. My question, final question, Louise, would be, you talked about Lagos. We, we have a conference here in the UK, and with all the problems, the general feeling is, if everybody tried very hard, we could get there. If you were having this conference in Lagos, how would it go? Well, we just did, two weeks ago. Uh, and it's the, the second time we've done it. And, and interesting, and the lights went out four times, which is perfectly <laughs> normal. Uh, and you lose the AV, so you have to holler at each other. You don't worry about your handheld mics and all the rest of it. It's a completely different uh, uh, and a very fun in, in environment in some ways to, to have the privilege to, to, to be part of. Um, this is the, the, the reason for the Energy Institute being active in, in Lagos in West Africa is because there is a, a wealth of expertise from people who've had decades of experience and obviously are largely simply frustrated by the lack of governance uh, and leadership that they have at state level to solve their own energy problems as opposed to just send it wherever they get the best price, uh, which is their big challenge. So even if they just stop flaring all the gas, problem solved. Uh, and I think a gentleman that mentioned energy from waste, another massive opportunity when you sit and you see uh, how the lack of infrastructure means you are literally surrounded by, by waste. Uh, and whilst I would just say that the first thing you should do is try and get rid of it, as opposed to produce it in the first place, uh, ultimately, whatever you're left with, then, then, then energy from waste is an opportunity, uh, largely, again, for reproducing as, uh, and putting gas back into the system. So. In, in Lagos, this conversation actually is quite similar. It is about the interconnections between the system. It's about the technological opportunities. It's about the regulatory framework that's needed. Uh, it's about how we incentivize certain technologies to go faster than others. Uh, and, and that balance in, in terms of internal development and energy being an economic enabler, uh, as well as for human well-being, balanced with 
meeting the commitments of country budgets that maybe a lot of, in their, sadly, in their position, a lot of the population don't see the benefit of. Uh, so there's a lot. You'd be surprised by how many similarities there are. Obviously, their starting position is very different. That's fundamentally it. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the human capability is there to make the changes that need to be made. Well, look, thank you very much, both of you, for that. I mean, it's, it's overrun, but I think it's overrun because by the nature of the questions and the amount of interest, I thought they were two fascinating presentations and to thank them in the conventional way.